If you brought your Bible today or your iPad, would you go ahead and raise it up and we will make our Sunday morning declaration. This is the Word of God. It is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of God abides forever. It's a lamp to my feet and a light into my path. It is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. I believe everything it says. I am who it says I am. I have what it says I have. And I can do what it says I can do. And everyone agreeing said, Amen and Amen. Well, in the first epistle of Peter, Peter, as we have discovered, is writing to Christians who are in the pains of persecution. And in today's passage that we're going to be looking at, he talks about the importance of setting apart Jesus as Lord of our hearts and how this is really the key to not only living the Christian life, but sharing the Christian faith. And we're actually going to focus uh, on verse 15 next time we are together, which again addresses setting apart Jesus as Lord over our hearts because it really deserves a message all by itself. But Peter, after making this declaration, he then goes on to talk about giving a defense of the heart hope that is within us because people will want to know how we as Christians can have hope in a seemingly hopeless situation. And so I think it's very appropriate that this morning as we uh, begin the Advent season that the very first candle that was lit was the candle of hope. The candle of of hope. People, as they observe our lives, as we walk through times of suffering and sorrow, they are going to want to know how we can have hope in a seemingly hopeless situation. How can we have faith when everything around us tells us to fear? How can we be strong in the midst of threats and intimidation? Well, Peter, he tells us how to do these things in 1 Peter chapter 3. If you have not turned there yet, I would encourage you to if you're not real familiar with the Bible. 1 Peter is in your New Testament. It is right after Hebrews and James, before 2 Peter, of course, and then the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd epistle of John. 1 Peter chapter 3, and we'll be looking at verses 13 through 17 this morning. Peter continues in his epistle, and he says in verse 13, Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation, and do not be troubled. Verse 15 but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. Verse 16, And keep a good conscience, so that in the thing which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better, if God should will it so, that you suffer for doing what is right, rather than for doing what is wrong. And so, here in verses 13 through 17, Peter, he basically is instructing us 
us on the manner in which we should share or defend our faith. The manner in which we should defend the hope that is within us. And the very first thing that he exhorts us to do when it comes to defending the hope that is within us is he tells us in verse 13 that we are to be zealous in the New American Standard version. Be zealous, and this word zealous, it, it speaks of an authentic, genuine follower of Christ. The real deal. And so the first thing that we discover when it comes to defending the hope that is within us is that our faith must be real. Our faith must be alive. We must be zealous. That is a Christian who is on fire. And Jesus addressed this with the church of Laodicea, didn't he? Where he told them that he would rather have them hot, that literally white hot, or cold, but because they were lukewarm, he would spew them out of his mouth. Authentic Christians are hot Christians. They are on fire Christians. And so we must be zealous towards God and towards the things of God. Simply put, there must be a fire burning in our hearts that, hear this, far exceeds the persecution or suffering that we may be going through. And the reason why is this. Because the greater fire will always consume the lesser fire. And so the fire within us must be greater than the fires of persecution or suffering that may come upon us. I am reminded of the fire on the altar in the Old Testament that the priests were commanded to keep going on a perpetual basis. I would like us to read this out loud. Together, Leviticus chapter 6, verse 13, let's begin. The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. I love that. The fire should continually be burning on the altar, and it should never, ever go out. And you see, loved ones, such symbolism reflects all our relationship with God and how we as a royal priesthood, which Peter calls us in 1 Peter chapter 2, how we should be constantly stoking the fires of faith that burn within us. They should never go out. I'm also reminded of the children of Israel when they were wandering in the wilderness and how God led them by a cloud during the day but a pillar of fire at night. And in the same way, when we experience the darkness of our soul, that dark night of the soul, when darkness comes crashing in upon us and surrounds us, listen, there is a fire created by God Himself that will lead us through the night. And so Peter here is telling us to be on fire for God because that's what a real Christian, an authentic, genuine Christian is. Make sure you have a flaming heart. A flaming heart is one that burns with the Spirit of Christ. A flaming heart confronts sin with the power of the cross. A flaming heart can never be quenched, nor can the floods drown it. I love what John the Baptist said early on in his ministry in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 3 verse 11 he says I baptize you with a baptism of repentance but there is one coming after me that is Jesus who will baptize you in the 
spirit and with fire. You see, fire has always been reflective of the people of God. And fire has always been reflective of our faith in God. And yet, we must also heed Jesus' warning later on in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 24 when he spoke these words. He said, because of the increase of wickedness, listen, the love of most will grow cold. Notice he didn't say the love of some or the love of many. He says the love of most will grow cold, and that word most is most concerning to me. Why did their love grow cold? The fire went out. It's that simple. The fire went out. Instead of being zealous, these are people who will become cold and callous, and in doing so are going to lose their witness to the world. And so, as Peter talks about us as a community of believers, and how we are to defend the hope that is within us, he says, first of all, you must be zealous. You must be the real deal. You have to be genuine on fire for God and the things of God. And then he goes on in verse 14 and he tells us as well, do not fear. That's the second thing when it comes to defending the hope that is within us. And I think we can all relate to that, can't we? Fear is perhaps the greatest obstacle to evangelism that there is. It is easy, especially when being persecuted, to shrink back and to allow yourself to be intimidated. And this is the temptation that we face on a daily basis. And it was the temptation that these early church believers were certainly facing as Nero was beginning to put the pressure upon the Christian church during this time. Now, what is interesting to me about this uh, exhortation that Peter gives is this. Peter can relate to this firsthand. Think of Peter's life. He can relate to this in a very personal way because you have to remember it was because of fear that Peter denied Jesus on three different occasions. He allowed fear and intimidation to quench his testimony and his defense of the hope that is within him. But let me tell you something. The awesome thing is that Peter learned to overcome his fears because later on we read how after James was killed, Peter was then arrested and he was thrown into prison, knowing that in all likelihood his fate was going to be the very same thing as the apostle James was, the disciple James. Now keep your mark in 1 Peter chapter 3, but would you turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 12, and we get to read a little bit about... Peter's own suffering, his own persecution, the attack upon his faith, Acts chapter 12, and we'll just read the first part of this story, we won't read the whole thing, it says this, Herod, I believe this is Herod Agrippa, now about that time Herod the king laid hands on some who belonged to the church and this some who belonged to the church is speaking about a, a select group an intentionality it wasn't just anyone it was certain someones and Peter was one of those so he laid hands on some who belonged to the church why 
in order to mistreat them. And he had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. Remember, Jesus was arrested during this time as well in his life. Verse 4, when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him to four squads of soldiers to guard him. And that's because uh, there were four watches in the day. And so th basically this is saying that he was being watched and guarded 24-7. He put him in prison, delivering him to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out before the people. And so Peter was kept in the prison, but prayer for him was being made fervently by the church of God. Now, as we read on, we, we learn, we, we just read this in verse 5, that upon Peter's arrest, the church immediately begins to not just flippantly pray, but we are told that they fervently began to pray on Peter's behalf. And you know, saints, this should be an exhortation to us where we should always, always pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ. As a matter of fact, let's just stop for a brief moment and do that, shall we? Father, we pray for the suffering church throughout the world. Those who are being persecuted for their faith. Those who have been imprisoned for their faith. And Lord, we pray that you would come alongside them and comfort them and strengthen them and deliver them by your mighty, righteous right hand, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. And so we should always pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted. This is what the early church did. And if we were to continue to read throughout this story, we see that God sent an angel to Peter while he was in prison. You guys remember this story, right? And so the angel comes. And do you remember what Peter was doing in prison when the angel showed? Up. Scripture says he was sleeping. He was sleeping. But he wasn't only sleeping, we're also told that he was sleeping in between his persecutors. In other words, what the scripture tells us is that there was a Roman soldier on each side of Peter watching him, guarding him very, very closely. But you see, here's the cool thing that we discover about Peter, and that is even though Peter's life was at risk, he was at rest. Let me say that again. Even though Peter's life was at risk, he was at rest. He did not allow fear to rob him of his peace. He was able to sleep. He did not allow fear to rob him of his faith. And so, you see, the point is this, that Peter was able to write this epistle that we're studying this morning. He was able to give these instructions about not fearing actually from a place of victory rather than defeat. You see, Peter had learned how to suffer well. Peter had learned how to overcome fear, and he is instructing us from a first-hand experience. And guys, this should encourage us, because listen, what you are struggling with today, whether it be fear or anger or whatever it might be, you can be freed from that and delivered from that tomorrow. And that's the whole joy of the gospel is that it's good news. And part of the good news is that it changes our lives. And we see how it changed Peter's life. Now, it took, it, it took some time, just like it will take some time with you and with me. But he went from a place, listen, a place of fear to a place of faith. And God can do that in your life and in my life as well. Areas that we have great fear about, 
God can actually turn that fear into faith. And that's what we see here. He learned to overcome his fear and to walk in faith. And he's telling the church that as we defend the hope that is within us, we must not only be zealous, but don't fear. Don't allow yourself to be intimidated. He goes on in verse 15, and he gives us the third exhortation. And that is, he tells us that we are also to be gentle. Notice, give a defense to everyone who asks to give an account for the hope that is within you, yet with gentleness. He says, be gentle in the defense of the hope that is within you. This word gentle, it speaks of an inward grace of the soul that God desires for us to walk in. It is a virtue that is born in strength of character. And it's the opposite of being ungracious and harsh and heated, which we can sometimes be. You see, hear this. Truth that is absent of grace is a misrepresentation of the truth truth giver. You see, truth must always be served on a platter of grace. And therefore, wherever grace is missing, God is missing. Did you hear that? Wherever grace is missing, God is missing. We talked last week about James and John, whose nicknames were the sons of thunder, by the way. And we talked about how they wanted to call fire down from heaven to consume a town that had rejected Jesus. You see, they were anything but gentle in their behavior. They forgot that Jesus did not come into the world to judge the world, but to save the world. I like David's representation of God in the Psalms. He says this, listen. He says, you, O Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in mercy and in truth. Isn't that the type of God that you want to worship? Isn't that the type of God that we love and we want to serve and, and, and give our lives to? David also said something else very interesting. In Psalm 18, verse 35, if it's not in your notes, you may want to write that down. He says this. He says, your gentleness has made me great. Wow. You could spend a while unpacking that. Your gentleness has made me great. In other words, we become great in the kingdom of God when we relate to others in the same way that God has related to us. When we understand that gentleness is a part of God's nature and a part of God's character, we start to get it. And we start to relate to others in the way that He has called us to relate, the way that He relates to us. You see, the first aim, goal in evangelism, in defending the hope that is within us, is to rightly represent the character and the person of Jesus Christ. That's our number one goal. And so here's the deal. If in your witness you proclaim the right doctrine, but you portray the wrong Christ, all you will produce is another Pharisee. You see, it's not just about proclaiming the right doctrine. It's also about portraying the right Christ. Gentle evangelism is witnessing with an open hand. Harsh evangelism is witnessing with a closed fist. The first is open and soft. The second is hard and closed. The first does so in joy. The second does so with judgment, you see. And so Peter, he's teaching us here to be bold. He's saying, have a bold witness, but also while having a gentle soul. That gentleness is the way 
of the kingdom of God. You see, it is possible to be strong and soft at the same time. And Proverbs tells us that a gentle answer will turn away wrath. Gentleness is a fruit of the Spirit, and it's been described as love's conduct. I like that. Gentleness is love's conduct. In Colossians chapter 4, verse 6, Paul writes this. He says, Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. We loved ones in every arena of life should have gentleness as our companion. We should defend the faith with a strong witness that is accompanied by a gentle spirit. And so, he says, be zealous, do not fear, be gentle in, in, in your spirit, don't be harsh with, with people because they disagree with you about the gospel or, or, or they, they, they don't know about the gospel. Don't be frustrated with them. And then in verse 15, after he tells us that we're to be gentle, he also says that as we defend the hope that is within us, we are also to show reverence. That's interesting. Show reverence. In other words, defend the faith with a godly fear, realizing where that person is headed to apart from Jesus Christ. This word reverence, it reflects a humble timidity versus self-righteously you know, tearing into someone or putting someone down. You see, we do so with reverence because, hear this, the goal of defending the hope that is within us is to win a soul, not win an argument. And we can't make winning an argument our goal. Philip Yancey said, nobody ever converted to Christianity because they lost an argument. And I think that's probably true. Listen, if you love to debate, it is very possible, let me say very likely, that you will be speaking out of pride rather than passion. Loved ones, let passion be your guide. Let passion for Jesus be your motivation, not proving a point or putting someone in their place. You see, wisdom appeals to people. Pride argues with people. Wisdom thinks of the other person. Pride focuses on yourself. And so, if our goal is to win an argument, you see, we have already lost in the eyes of God. Please hear this. Please hear this, this plea. Loved ones, never, ever, ever lose sight of the person that is in front of you. Never lose sight of the soul that is in front of you. If your goal is to win a debate rather than touch a life, something is wrong, and that person may very well remain in darkness. Realize that they are someone who is lost that needs to be found. You don't ridicule and beat up someone and, and argue with them because they're lost. You help them find where they need to go. They're blind and they need to see. And therefore, approach that person in reverence or in the fear of the Lord. Reverence should be your companion because this is a soul, listen, that will one day stand in judgment before God. One day they are going to stand before God on Judgment Day. And so, let's not be argumentative. And let's not be arrogant. You see, you can be confident without being arrogant. We can be bold without being brash or belligerent. It has been said, and I, I love this, when it comes to witnessing, defending the hope that is within us, when it comes to evangelism, that evangelism is merely one beggar telling another beggar where they can find bread. 
Isn't that cool? And so, we must seek to be a humble witness of God's grace. Witness from the posture of a servant, not someone who sees themselves as superior. Arrogant people are concerned with how they look. Humble people are concerned with how God looks. Let's be concerned with how God looks. And finally, when it comes to this reverence, we must first and foremost have a reverence for God when we defend the hope that is within us. Realizing that we really are representing Him. You know, Moses, as great as a man of God as he was, he was not permitted to enter into the promised land because he misrepresented God to the children of Israel. May we never, ever make that same mistake. May people never come to a false impression of God because of something that we say or something that we do. And so, Peter is exhorting us when it comes to defending the faith. And he wants us to be zealous. He wants us to not fear. He wants us to be uh, gentle. He wants us to show reverence. And then the final thing that he talks about is he, he says he also wants us to have a good conscience. And we sing about that a little bit in one of the songs that uh, we sung this morning. Having a good conscience. And what Peter's saying here is let your own good conscience come forth as a witness to your works and your words of faith. 1 Timothy 1.5 says, But the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart. Here it is, a good conscience and a sincere faith. Both Peter and Paul inform and instruct us about the importance of having a good conscience as believers in Jesus Christ. And so, have a good conscience, a holy conscience, not a haunting conscience filled with regret and remorse. And in case you don't know, your conscience is that little voice inside of you that tells you that something is wrong. Right? Don't do this. Don't steal this. Don't say this. It's always there monitoring our thoughts. Always there monitoring our behavior. If I could illustrate this uh, to, to, to kind of magnify and highlight uh, what, what Peter is telling us and what this good conscience is, uh, a, a conscience is kind of like some of these brand new cars that, you know, they're all computerized and, and they can actually speak to you. Yeah. Do you guys have one of those cars? I, I, I have a car, it's 95, and it, it notifies me of, of things. It doesn't speak, but, but stuff comes up on the screen. And it tells me what's wrong with the car. And it communicates in different ways. Sometimes a bell rings, and it tells me I need to put on my seatbelt. Or I need to close the door. That's always a good idea before you go driving off, I'm told. But some of these more newer contraptions, they speak to you. And they have a very polite voice, don't they? And they'll let you know if you're low on gas. Or if you're low, low on oil. Or even your tire pressure. They'll, they'll, it will inform you in a very nice voice that you need to resolve this problem. And the thing with this conscience in our car is that it will continue to remind you of the problem until you get it fixed. Right? 
That, my friends, is your conscience. Now, Scripture speaks about a seared conscience. And a seared conscience is when we keep hearing this voice and we're tired of hearing it and so we rip out the wires or we disconnect because we want to stop hearing the voice. Right? And so the simple answer is just get rid of the voice and that's what people do when they have a seared conscience. They want to get rid of the voice of God because it's convicting them of their lives and so the only way is to disconnect from God completely. And many of us know people who have made that decision in their lives. The scriptures talk about a defiled conscience, and this is when we mix truth with lies, and there's pollution that occurs in our lives. And the Bible talks about a poisoned conscience, and this is when someone just drinks all the Kool-Aid. They, 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 they just totally buy into the ways of the world and the ways of darkness. And Peter is telling us, make it your goal to have a good conscience before God. So Peter, he's saying, let your life be part of your defense. Don't have a guilty conscience. Let your behavior be reflective of your beliefs. Because you see, great confidence can be birthed as the result of a good conscience. The greater, the clearer your conscience, the greater and clearer your message and your confidence, and therefore the defense you provide of the hope that is within you. And so what we're discovering here as we study this first epistle of Peter is that we have a faith to declare. We have a hope to defend. And we have a love to demonstrate. And in order to do so, we must resolve to be these authentic, genuine type of believers that Peter is highlighting here in this passage. We are called to be what one person referred to as the fellowship of the unashamed. I want you to read what this man wrote, or woman, I don't know really who it was. But it's called The Fellowship of the Unashamed, and we'll close with this. It says, I am a part of the fellowship of the unashamed. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense, and my future is secure. I am finished and done with low living, sight walking, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, uh, tame visions, mundane talking, chintzy giving, and dwarf goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, plaudits, or popularity. I don't have to be right, first, tops, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by the presence, learn by faith, love by patience, lift by prayer, and labor by power. My pace is set. My gate is fast. My goal is is heaven. My road is narrow. My way is rough. My companions are few. My guide is reliable and my mission is clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, deterred, lured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of adversity, negotiate at the table of the enemy, ponder at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't 
give up, back up, let up, or shut up until I've preached up, prayed up, paid up, stored up, and stayed up for the cause of Christ. I am a disciple of Jesus. I must go until He returns, give until I drop, preach until all know, and work until He comes. And when He comes, He will have no problem recognizing me. I am a part of the fellowship of the unashamed. This, my friends, is the type of person that Peter is exhorting us to be as we study through this profound and this powerful epistle. And this, my friends, is the type of person that is going to change the world. Would you stand with me? Let's close in this prayer. Let's pray it out loud together. Let's begin. Father God, today I join the fellowship of the unashamed. I realize that I have a faith to declare, a hope to defend, and a love to demonstrate. Help me to be zealous and on fire for you. And help me to overcome my fears when it comes to sharing my faith. Form within me a reverence for truth and a gentle of soul which is born out of a strong character and may I always have a good conscience because my behavior is consistent with my beliefs in Jesus name I pray amen I'm going to ask the prayer team to come forward the elders to come forward and if you uh, are in need of prayer for anything this morning, we want to pray with you and for you and over you. This uh, is a perfect opportunity for you to come. Maybe you're between jobs, you might have health issues, relationship issues, whatever it might be. We all have issues, right? And so we want to welcome you and encourage you to come and to receive prayer. And should you be here uh, this morning... And you have never made that step of faith when it comes to Jesus Christ. You know, he was more than a teacher, more than a good man, more than a religious leader, more than a prophet, as we're going to be learning as we once again celebrate Christmas, that he was both son of man and son of God. And he was sent into this world that all who might believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For Jesus came into the world not to judge the world but that the world might be saved through him. And that offer is to everyone at any time. You can't bargain, you can't buy it, you, you can't work for it. It is a free gift, but it must be received by faith. If you've never made that step of faith, I want to encourage you to do so this morning. Let Christmas be truly Christmas when Christ comes and dwells within your heart. And when Jesus becomes Lord of our hearts. God bless you guys. He loves you. He's for you. Tongue is red. 
restless I will hold my peace and I'll slow down Follow your lead I will sit at your feet Till all my striving cease For God is good He's in control My refuge and my shelter from the storm The more I learn The less it seems I know But Jesus, you are all I have to hold Jesus, you are all I have to own. our deep need for you, God, in this world that's trying to take away our faith and uh, trying to do everything to, to strip that away from us, God. So we know that, uh, that you are holding on, Lord, that, that height nor death, but nothing can ever separate us from your love, God. So we just, we give you our lives and pray that, that you would hold on to us, Lord, and just help us throughout this week and this month, God, the coming years, just help us to, to put our faith and trust in you and everything, Jesus. Amen. Amen. 